This video is going to continue our talk on the structure of the nervous system, the nerves, and how they communicate. So we said the functional unit of your nervous system is your neuron. Your neuron has those dendritic projections where it takes in signaling and it'll process that signal in the cell body and then send the impulse down the axon, right? All the way down to the axon terminal. And that axon terminal will release some neurotransmitters and the cycle will repeat itself. And that's the functional unit of your nervous system, your neurons, and that's how they communicate through neurotransmitters. Now, this is what it looks like microscopically. What does it look like grossly? When you cut open a body and you see the nerves, is that nerve just one giant axon? No. It's not just one giant neuron. It's in fact a bunch of neurons that group together to make that nerve. So if we take a large nerve and we biopsy it and we cut it open, you'll see that a single neuron makes up very little of it. We'll just say this is a single neuron. And that single neuron is covered by something called endoneurium. But you get enough of those single neurons together and you get this bundle. This entire bundle, now we're working with something. This entire bundle is wrapped by something called the perineurium. And there'll be a ton of these bundles and a ton of these wrappings of perineurium all over this large nerve. The culmination of which makes this large nerve. And the final thing that covers it all is going to be your epineurium. Understand. Let's say you suffer some nerve damage and you transected the nerve. So now you have something that looks like this. All right, you've cut the nerve in half. Can we just place these two back together? No, we have to match up these bundles, wouldn't we? Otherwise it wouldn't really work. It wouldn't really take root. I guess you could say. So if we want to reconnect the nerves and just pray that, that it'll regenerate and restore itself, then we have to make sure we match up the perineurium. So I'll just write, during surgery, match up perineurium. That is the structure, the overall structure of your nerves. Now, how do they communicate? Well, they communicate through neurotransmitters. And that will be our next topic. So neurotransmitters. <coughs> Neurotransmitters come in a variety of form and they need to come in a variety of form because we have so many different functions that we need to perform. So that, that variety just allows us to perform those various functions. The biggest ones are going to be your excitatory neurotransmitter, which makes you have an impulse and make you do whatever you want to do. And then we're going to need an inhibitory neurotransmitter, which stops impulses, stops you. And those two main ones, excitatory and inhibitory, helps us do the majority of our things. So we'll talk about excitatory first. Excitatory. This is going to be glutamate. Glutamate. Glutamate you can make from your TCA cycle, so your, that's your Krebs cycle. And glutamate will hit various receptors. One of the big ones is n methyl D aspartate receptors or NMDA. That's how we're going to refer to them from now on. And when it hits those, it'll influx things like calcium and sodium and depolarize whatever neuron it needs to depolarize and it'll send that signal. That's what makes it excitatory. Can you have too much of a good thing? Yeah, you can have excess calcium, you can have excess sodium, and that can kill the cell. And so, too much, I'll just write too much equals neurotoxic. Neurotoxic. That's your excitatory. Now let's talk about your inhibitory. If you take glutamate and you run it through some enzymes that you don't need to know, you run it through some enzymes. What you do need to know is the enzymes use a cofactor, and that cofactor is our friendly B6. So if you take glutamate and you run it through those enzymes, and you'll get our inhibitory neurotransmitter, and that is GABA. GABA is our main inhibitory neurotransmitter. And you should know what GABA stands for. GABA stands for gamma, amino, butyric acid. I've seen a lot of easy questions on gamma, but on GABA, but instead of them saying GABA on the answer choices, they'll say this. And if you don't know that, 
it's GABA, you might get thrown off and get the question wrong. So just know what GABA stands for. And when it hits recept the GABA receptors, it'll open chloride channels. Chloride, that's negatively charged. That hyperpolarizes the cell and stops the cell from sending impulses. That's what makes it inhibitory. So now you make GABA in numerous places, but one place that you should know where it's highly concentrated is your nucleus accumbens. All right. And another thing you should know is GABA works great in the brain, but in the spinal cord, we use something else. We use glycine, glycine. Glycine is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter in your spinal cord. So right, glycine, spinal cord. And it particularly works, glycine particularly works on these cells called Renshaw cells. Renshaw cells, what the heck are Renshaw cells? Renshaw cells are cells in your gray matter that monitor your, your muscle activity, monitor how fast it's depolarizing. And if it's going too fast, it's, it basically tells itself, I need to slow down. I need some glycine. I need to inhibit this, this really rapid depolarization. Otherwise I'm gonna get injured or I might get hurt. So your Renshaw cells monitor that. And if it comes to a point where the firing is too quick or too rapid or too much, then glycine will say, I'll inhibit it. And that's how they work, okay? So glycine is your main inhibitor in your spinal cord and it works on your Renshaw cells. Gotta know that. Some pathology, there are some chemicals that can block glycine, like sterknine, and that causes death, as you can imagine, all right? Let's move on to some other neurotransmitters, acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is made out of acetyl, I don't need to write this down, I don't think you need to know it, but it's made out of acetyl-CoA and choline, and when you put them together, you get acetylcholine. Choline, acetylcholine does, does everything, basically. So I'm not gonna write down the functions because that wouldn't really get us anywhere. But acetylcholine is made in a lot of places, but you should know that it's seen in high concentrations in the basal nucleus of Maynard. The basal nucleus of Maynard. Keep that locked in the back of your mind because when we talk about things like Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's obliterates this, and if you obliterate this, then your acetylcholine will drop. And that's exactly what you see in Alzheimer's. So basal nucleus of Maynard. Dopamine is another big one. It does a ton of different things in a ton of different places. You can see dopamine made in high concentrations in your phantom. Tegmentum. You can also see it in other places. You can see it in your substantia nigra. That's what, that's a part of our basal ganglia. And if you have a loss of that, you see it in Parkinson's. We're gonna talk about all that Parkinson's stuff later on. So as of right now, you should know it's seen in your ventum tenmentum because we're not gonna touch on this for the rest of this block, but I've seen a lot of questions where it'll talk about dopamine, talk about where it's made in the CNS. Okay, norepi. Found in a lot of places, but locus ceruleus is what you need to know in terms of where it's found in the brain. And locus ceruleus is seen in your pons. And you know what norepi does, especially in kind of like the basal level, it monitors your, or mediates your alertness. So in some pathology, if you have anxiety or you have mania, then norepi is increased. If you have depression, then norepi is decreased. But for your intents and purposes, also know where it's Found. Serotonin, seen in your Rathi nucleus. That's something you should know. There's this net like pattern around your brainstem that deals with a lot with your norepi and your serotonin called the reticular activating system. And your reticular. Reticular means that reticular activating system uh, mediates your awakeness. What happens if you destroy this reticular activating system? Then you fall into a coma, you can't wake up. I know that was a lot of information, but you gotta know the basics as well as know where everything is made or seen predominantly. Okay, so I, I unfortunately haven't found an easy way to memorize it other than just kind of rote memorization, make flashcards. But you gotta know it because I've seen a couple questions on it. That's how your cells communicate, neurotransmitters. 
And in the classic sense, it was one neuron sending neurotransmitters to another neuron. And that goes on and on and on, and that's how they communicate. But sometimes you can have different ways of doing things. We're going to look at the skin and how, and how the skin does things. Feeling sensation in your skin is incredibly important because our skin is kind of like a first line defense, our external surface. And so it has come up with a lot of creative ways to send signals, you know, send information, ways that we haven't talked about before. So we're going to take the skin, for example, just to kind of illustrate the creative ways our bodies, our bodies can send signals. So in your skin, our right, skin, you have a lot of receptors that can sense different stimuli. Some of them are very rudimentary, are rudimentary. For example, you can have free nerve endings, free nerve endings. And this is exactly what it sounds like. So this is your skin. Then you literally have a nerve that just opens up towards your skin. Totally unencapsulated, totally free. And it'll be able to sense changes in temperature and pain. And then it'll send that signal to other neurons and Get it where it needs to go to your brain and they'll say oh i'm having temperature or pain in this area yeah so these are your free nerve endings and there are a couple of different varieties so for example your alpha delta variety will sense things like cold temp and localized sharp pain and your alpha delta is very thin and myelinated that means you can send very quick signals you can have another subtype called your C fibers, and your C fibers will sense hot temperature. And instead of localized pain, it'll sense more kind of dull, diffuse pain. Dull, diffuse. And these C fibers are thicker, they're unmyelinated. So, how, how would that change the speed of the impulse? It would be slower. It will be slower. Another type of receptor in the skin is going to be called your Ruffini. Your Ruffini is very similar to your free nerve endings, but your Ruffinis are surrounded by collagen. Okay? All right, collagen. Collagen. And when there's any type of movement in that collagen, then it'll cause this neuron to depolarize and send a signal down and send it where it needs to go and says, hey, there's a change in signal here. Now, where it's found, it's gonna be found in your skin. Your skin has a lot of collagen, especially in the soles of your feet. Another place that has a lot of collagen is gonna be your joints. And so it'll be able to sense kind of pressure in your joints, changes in joint motion. Let me write that down. Sorry, pressure, joint angle, and something called slippage where you can feel something slip as it's displacing that collagen and causing that nerve impulse all right so slippage so these are very rudimentary but we have some other more complicated structures we could have your meisner structure so your meisners look kind of like a, a disc and you'll have these plates inside and then on the bottom you'll have a nerve and if there's some sort of stimuli that pushes on this disc, then these plates will move. And ions will flow and depolarize this nerve and send signals where it needs to go. This can't be too deep because it likes to sense light touch. So it'll be very superficial and it'll be in places like hairless skin. That way you can really make sure you sense that stimuli. So our hairless skin. Sometimes a fancy word is glabrous skin. Now, if you withdraw that stimuli, then these plates will kind of readjust and the nerve will stop, stop sending signals. So you need constant, I guess, nudging. I don't know if that's a scientific word, but we can't just have it on there. We need, so we need constantly changing stimuli. We can't just leave that stimuli on there, otherwise they'll stop sending signals. We need to constantly activate it. A fancy way of saying this is that these Meisner 
structures adapt quickly. So if you don't have that constant stimuli, then you'll no longer feel it. Yeah. So your body would have adapted to it. It adapts quickly. So that's just a fancy way of saying that. Another structure you can have is Pacinian. And these look kind of like concentric circles. Sometimes we call it lamellar. Lamellar means layers, and that's what it looks like. It looks like layers. And when there's a force, especially a vibration, then it'll shake these layers and these and ions will be able to flow through and reach the more inner layer. And that that inner layer will shake and ions will flow through and reach the inner layer. And you keep, you keep going until you reach the center. And guess what's in the center? That's right, a nerve. And that nerve will depolarize and send a signal. All right. So these need a little deeper stimuli, usually in the form of vibration, to get these lamellar layers to shake. So this will be in deeper skin also. All right, deeper. And kind of the same principle. If you leave that there or if you withdraw, then these layers will stop shaking, basically, and stop depolarizing. So you need a constant, consistently changing stimuli. So these are also quickly adaptive. Quickly adaptive. Last but not least, Meckel's. Meckel's disc. Now Meckel's disc are really disc at all. They're cells, they're keratinocytes, if you remember from our dermis, our dermatology block, keratinocytes are your skin cells. These are specialized skin cells. So, all right, specialized skin cells. And if you have done dermatology, then you know that your, most of your cells come from your basal layer. Yeah. Your epidermal basal layer. And this is no different. So this will be in your basal layer. And it looks like this giant goober with vesicles on the top and a nerve on the bottom. And when there's a stimuli that pushes on this goober, then these vesicles will rupture. And your neuron will sense these neurotransmitters and send that impulse. And as long as there's something pushing on here, then these vesicles will continue to rupture. All right? You don't need to constantly change stimuli. You can just press down on it. And so this, <coughs> and so this is actually slow adapting. Slow adapting. These are all creative ways we can sense things and send transmissions through our neurons. All right? So it's not just one size fits all. We have very creative ways to doing things. And I just want to illustrate the skin receptors as living proof. So hope you enjoyed the video. Hope that clears things up. Thanks.